You can sway a thousand men by appealing to their prejudice quicker than you can convince one man by logic. Robert A. Heinlein This is Professor Snappy Valentine, Professor of American Revolutionary War Studies at Yale University, author of many books, such as the classic American Revolutionary War, What Is It Good For? Sometime in the mid-1700s, Boston was a bustling port city with the large trade industry exported uh, the fish lumber, the farm products to the Europe. But you see, as tension grew between the Carlinists and the Britain, uh, the Boston, Boston became key contributor to the birthplace of the ideology of independence. Yes. Uh, why would you say Boston was a key contributor and the birthplace of the ideology of independence? Okay. So in 1763, the British, British, uh, when the Seven Years' of War, where basically they got land in America, right? And in 1765, Britain goes, hey, since we paid all this money for you to get all this land, you probably won't mind if we passed a little uh, stamp act, perhaps, where we place a little fancy schmancy stamp on all of your paper documents that you buy. And in return for our generosity, you give us the money. <laughs> As it turns out, the colonists, they did not like the paper tax idea too much. No, not because it has so high, but because they had no say, you know, no representation in parliament that made the tax. And also the colonists, they were a little cranky because there were all these British troops in the colonies and the British were like, you kiddos aren't grateful enough. And then the, the colonists were like, shut up, mom. We hate you, and then, and then the British were like, "As long as you live under our roof, it's our rules." So then, then these other guys called the the, the sons of liberty, right? These other guys, they came in. And they were like, no taxation without representation. Another idea. So the British were like, okay, okay. And they repealed the Stamp Act. And the Sons of Liberty were formed. The Sons of Liberty in Boston. And they met up. And they did lots of, uh, how you say, secret stuff. And they begin to spread and spread the propaganda. The propaganda. You see? Yes. Can I ask you to emphasize a little on who the Sons of Liberty were? Well, the Sons of Liberty were a group of communists that formed to protect their rights as Englishmen and maybe even create a new nation. Hello, boys. I have gathered you here down with me today because we are going to start a revolution. Together, we can change the hearts, the minds of our fellow countrymen. Behold, we will do it with this. And together, we will show them and the world that united, we can achieve independence. I agree! The Hi, I'm Thomas Paine. Uh, I escaped French per persecution, execution. And, um, I, oh yeah, I have a, a list here of things drawn up, just very commonsensical things that will inspire us to achieve independence from Britain. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Interesting fact about Paul Revere. I'm a silversmith. Mm. Those lobster backy lobster backs, they're slaughtering us one by one by one. And right here's the proof. Here's the proof those monsters 
They are sending us early to our graves. Us, innocent colonists. I agree! My name is James Oliver, and I consider myself more of a comedian than an activist. Uh, the real problem is how Britain treats us as if we have no voice, we have no say, right? Um, in our government, with our slogan, we need a new one, and I, I've got it right here. Okay, fellas? No taxation without representation. Huh? Fellas, let us demand that Andrew Oliver Okay, the stamp collector, stamp, stamp distributor, Thanks. stamp distributor, meet us at the Liberty Tree, and we will demand that he publicly resign. On August 14th, 1765, a straw-stuffed effigy of Andrew Oliver, the stamp distributor, hung from what was to become known as the Liberty Tree. Beside it hung a second effigy, representing the two British ministers who the colonists believed responsible for the Stamp Act. After Andrew Oliver resigned out of fear, he was still tormented by the Sons of Liberty, despite his disapproval towards the Stamp Act. The Liberty Tree became a gathering place for future protests, and was even a site for tarring and feathering by both the colonists and the British. Colonists in other towns adopted their own Liberty Trees, the tree soon became a symbol of the American Revolution. This poster was a piece of propaganda distributed by the Crown to reinforce the idea that the colonists were terrorists. The definition of propaganda states information or ideas that are spread by an organized group or government to influence people's opinions, especially by not giving all the facts or by secretly emphasizing only one way of looking at the facts. Propaganda can be spread in a multitude of fashions, Six main techniques of persuasion have been identified as follows. Ad hominem, a Latin phrase that has come to mean attacking one opponent as opposed to attacking their arguments. Ad nauseum, this uses tireless repetition of an idea. An idea, especially a simple slogan, that is repeated enough times may begin to be taken as the truth. This approach is more effective alongside the propagandist limiting or controlling the media. Appeal to authority. Appeals to authority cite prominent figures to support a position, idea, argument, or course of action. Appeal to fear. Appeals to fear seek to build support by instilling anxieties and panic in the general population. For example, Joseph Goebbels exploited Theodore Kaufmann's Germany Must Perish to claim that the Allies sought the extermination of the German people. Appeal to prejudice. Using loaded or emotive terms to attach value or moral goodness to believing the proposition. And wagon. Bandwagon appeals attempt to persuade the audience to join in and take the course of action that everyone else is taking. Join or Die, the first political cartoon to be published in a public newspaper, was a propaganda that appealed to fear. The first implication was that if the colonies didn't unite, death was inevitable. But later on, the snake was used as a trademark of the patriotic ideals. The Boston Massacre engraving is an example of ad hominem. Paul Revere attacked his British opponents as a people group rather than attacking their causes or arguments. James Otis's No Taxation Without Representation was a simple slogan that was repeated so many times during the Revolution that it became the truth for everyone, making this ad nauseum. Common Sense by Thomas Paine is another example of appeal to fear. It uses exaggerations of the consequences of staying loyal to the crown in order to scare the colonists into wanting independence. I'm angry because Britain keeps on taxing us for stuff we buy on an everyday basis. Let's revolt! We are throwing millions of dollars of merchandise off this ship because we're mad! The Boston Tea Party was the first major rallying cry to the Patriots to take action and boycott British goods.